about marketing is essentially anything that is like attractive marketing. So instead of things like billboards or magazine ads, it's, you know, building like SEO and website, things like that. So it attracts people to your site. Um, and the reason that this came about is because how we buy things has changed with the internet. You know, we have more power to do more research on what we're looking to buy. Um, so we don't just go out and buy, you know, whatever shoes we see because it was in an ad in a magazine. I mean, that might be part of how the process works, but that's usually not the, what makes you make a decision to purchase that pair of shoes. Um, so this is how it works. It starts with the awareness stage, consideration stage, and then the decision, decision stage. And they give an example here, like I have a sore throat, fever, and I'm achy all over. What's wrong with me? So you go to Google, search for that, and then they're like, oh, you probably have strep throat. <laughs> so what are my options for relieving or curing my symptoms? And then you get a bunch of different options, and then you make a decision. Um, so that's kind of how we purchase things nowadays. And we don't necessarily always realize that we're doing that because it's just kind of second nature to how we shop for things. So to flip that around from a marketing perspective, this is kind of what the marketing funnel looks like to reach those consumers now. And the way I like to break it down is I talk about marketing in kind of three areas where you need to focus. The first being lead gen and brand awareness. And both of those things really go hand in hand. Um, they st I don't know, people argue this, but they say that you have to see something like six or seven times before you actually remember or recognize the brand. So you have to have kind of both tactics going at the same time in order to generate leads. Um, and then there's lead nurturing. So if people are not necessarily ready to buy yet, you know, you have to keep giving them content and give them more information to help them make the decision, which is, you know, sales. And they give some good statistics here on the right where 75% of the website traffic is very top of the funnel. So that's like very just general awareness, like what do I need looking for potential th answers to questions. Middle of the funnel is gonna be 22% of the website traffic you get, which is like, why do I need it from you? So like learning in Yeti's case, like who is Yeti? What do you guys do? What are some projects you've worked on? case studies, things like that. Um, and bottom of the funnel is a very like two to 3% of website traffic. Um, and that's like, why should I buy now? Why should I buy from you now? Um, so to break that down into tactics, these are some pretty common top of the funnel tactics that we work on, um, SEO strategy which a lot of people talk about SEO and it can be like a big <laughs> scary thing, but it's really just kind of understanding who your buyer is, how they're using the internet and optimizing your content and your website for them. So by providing content offers and also good content on your blog, doing blogging on other blogs, um, and then optimizing your website to one, get people there. And then a middle of the funnel we'll talk about is like capturing those leads once they get there. Um, but other common top of the funnel tactics are partnerships, um, social media, webinars, events, and then of course advertising. So these last two, list building and advertising, those aren't necessarily inbound tactics, but they end up being part of tactics that go into digital marketing. Middle of the funnel tactics are, that's when we, you hear us talking about like workflows and email nurturing. Um, more specific content offers. So going back to like that first example, when someone's searching, um, you know, they have a sore throat or whatever, and now they know what the cause of that sore throat is. That's like more middle of the funnel type content. So they know kind of what they're looking for, um, or they know the more about the specific problem they have and are looking for more kind of specific answers and solutions to that problem. Um, also newsletters, which is something we do. Um, and that's a really good way to just kind of stay top of mind for people, um, especially for people who aren't necessarily ready to buy now, but might be in a year or so. Social media. And then we also do something called lead scoring. And then bottom of the funnel tactics, which are, you know, sales emails and outreach with sales materials, um, offering free consultations, comparison charts, 
and case studies. So that's when you're really trying to like close those leads that have come in and like why they should work with you. Um, and these are some best practices for blogging and social media, because these are ways that you guys can get immediately and directly involved in our marketing, if you'd like. So blogging can be a really, I think people struggle with it because they have a lot of times no idea where to start. Um, and so what I always do is create a very like organized editorial calendar um, that includes your blog title, your persona target. So who are you trying to reach? Like who's the audience you're trying to reach? Whether that's like a healthcare audience or a financial audience. Um, obviously your language and what you're talking about is going to be very different. Um, keyword for SEO sake, which we'll get into. Um, the format, I like to start with that because it helps before you even begin writing it, you understand like what type of format you're gonna write it in. So whether it's like a list, like 10 ideas to do something, um, or it can be like a checklist, 10 things you need to do. Um, the buyer stage, which is what we talked about at the beginning. Um, so that's like, whether it's awareness, lead generation, um, or consideration or decision making. Uh, and then I'll put an overview in. And so like when I make, I have an editorial calendar for my own personal blog about marketing and I just fill it out randomly when I'm reading articles on the website or coming across challenges that my clients have. Uh, and I'm like, okay, this is obviously something that one, other people are talking about or two, it's a problem that people have. And so I'll put it in my editorial calendar so that when I actually go to sit down to do blog writing, I already have an idea and I can already like get started on it. And I actually made you guys an editorial calendar template, and I'll share that with you guys if we want to use that. Um, and then writing it. So after, once I sit down, I have like all of, uh, everything outlined of how I'm gonna write this blog post more or less. Um, and what I like to do is set a time limit, or I'll go to like a coffee shop and like not be able to leave the coffee shop until I finish writing a blog. Because I think that's like a really hard part and like people, people tend to like write and then rewrite and try and like, and then get frustrated and like just leave the whole process behind. But I think if you just say, okay, I'm just sitting down, I'm going to do this in an hour and you just go ahead and write it, it gets done. Um, and these are just like some best practices here for when you're writing your blog post, things to keep in mind. Um, understanding your reader, writing for them. That's a big one that everyone struggles with, I think, because obviously, like for example, with Yeti, you guys understand like product development in and out, but the people that you're trying to target might have no idea about it. So sometimes you have to dumb it down even more so than you think you already are dumbing it down. Um, and then along those lines is writing clearly, stressing action, which is always a good way to get people involved and engaged in your content. Um, offer evidence, be specific, use white space, which is why, you know, you see a lot of list blog posts that do really well. Um, and on a strong point, I like to end all of our blog posts with a call to action to take. So like, what is the next step? After someone reads this article, you still want them engaging with your brand in some way. What is that going to be? Whether it's to read another article we've written or download an ebook or to talk to Tony. And then obviously headlines we know are an important part of blog writing. And then these are just kind of standard on page SEO practices that we call. Um, and the first is like a natural keyword density. So I'm sure you guys have heard of like how you need to include keywords and things. Um, and once you have a keyword picked out for your blog post, that should just kind of naturally appear in the content you're writing. Um, and that keyword should also go in the page title. Page titles should be between 40 and 70 characters. Um, the keyword phrase should be in the URL. So like if, let's say you wanted to do, like blog writing was your keyword, you would have like a blog post that's like 10 tips for blog writing. And you would have that be obviously in the page title, but then also in your URL. Um, I like to include credible links to higher ranking domain sites because um, that helps with your link building strategy. Um, two to three links to other blog posts that you've written that helps with your internal link building strategy. Um, making sure all images have alt tags with that keyword. And then you can put the keyword in H1, H2, or H3 formats. And then um, 
make sure you have a very captivating meta description with it in there. So those are just some basic things that actually help out a lot with SEO and they're pretty simple, quick things to do. But the reason that that's the third slide is because I always do this one first as <laughs> I sit down and I write it and then I'm like, okay, how can I optimize it for SEO and go back and do that. Um, and then the other thing you guys can help out with is social sharing, which I think everyone knows how to do social media pretty much. Um, but obviously you can share our content on your networks. I don't like to say like, if you're not on Twitter, don't force yourself to get on Twitter just to share our content. But if you're someone who has a Twitter presence or uses your LinkedIn presence pretty strongly and frequently, um, you should definitely be sharing our content there. Um, yeah. And these are just some examples I came up with. I don't know why this one didn't populate the image, but you know, just like doing, doing quick things like that, where it's like, hey, you know, sharing with your network, network, like would you like to talk to our CEO? Or sharing our content like that. This was a blog post that was written. Um, and then these are just some best practices for social sharing. Uh, LinkedIn posting on weekdays, which seems pretty obvious. And then these are just some common popular times that people have found. Twitter, for some reason, Friday is a very popular day on Twitter. Um, and then a good just kind of general guideline is to be real. Don't be too salesy. Use the same tone you would normally use on these networks. Don't ever force it. And yeah, we'll get back to these questions, but I think that's kind of a rundown. Thanks.